Greetings and welcome everyone. My name is Marjan Kapoor. I'm a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute's Iran program, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our panel discussion on Iran's low, record low vo voter turnout, why voters turned away, and what it means for the Islamic Republic's future. For a majority of Iranians, the March 1st elections was a referendum on the future of the Islamic Republic. The 2024 election was neither free nor fair. And this is why Iranians opted to ignore the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei's call to go and vote. With only 41% of those eligible coming out to cast their ballots, according to their regime's own statistics. Frustration among young Iranians who feel the government's priorities do not reflect their own was especially pronounced. The real question now is what comes next? Mm -hmm. To discuss why the voters stayed away and what are the factors that are important to average Iranians, the Middle East Institute or MEI is delighted to host a panel of experts to analyze the results of these recent opinion polls and the uh, elections that has been conducted by Stasis Consulting Group. What are the key policy concerns among various Iranian demographic groups? How do young Iranians in particular feel about the political situations and their future prospects? And what are the survey findings and each election results tell us about where the country might be headed? Well, to delve into these questions and hear some of yours, we have a panel of wonderful experts, but in the interest of time, I will only introduce the panelists by their names and affiliations. And you are welcome to go uh, on the website of this uh, 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 event and review their full and impressive bios um, at your leisure. Um, to get us started on the conversation, we first have Ali Ghafouri, who is the CEO of Stasis Consulting Group. Next, we have Mehzad Bujerdi, who is the Vice Provost and Dean of College of Arts and Sciences and Education Professor um, at the political, um, uh, uh, and Political Science at the Department of History and Political Science at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And last but not least, we have Alex Vatanha, who is the Director of the Iran Program here at the MEI. Um, I encourage all of you to submit your questions uh, via the Zoom's Q&A feature. I will be looking at all of your questions and will be including as many of them as possible. And without further ado, um, we're gonna get started with today's conversation. And uh, Arash, I'm gonna turn to you. If you can um, start us off by taking us through some of your survey findings. What are some of the key impressions and um, and uh, findings that you have um, accumulated from um, from your um, research and from the recent election results. Mayor, please get us started. Thank you, Arash. Arash, you're on mute. Yes, I was mute. I'm so sorry. So thank you so much, Marjan John. I'm going to uh, share my screen with you for the sake of time to go to the straight to the poll. So I, I want to thank you, MEI, and all of you for the participation in this event. This is a, I mean, for the sake of time, I'm going to just stay to the, to the poll and get some findings of the poll that we can discuss later. If you have any opinion, we can talk later, later on. So this is the first of the, I mean, last at least six surveys in the next two years, or I would say maybe one and a half, that we are going to measure some uh, social political indicators in Iran, as well as some other important topics of the time that we conduct our poll. In this poll that we conducted on between five, uh, February 5 to 14, 2024, it was uh, maybe months ago, so here are the main findings of our poll. Our poll suggests that Iran's parliamentary election will see a record low turnout. Based on our poll, it was 34%. And for the first time, expected voters turnout is predicted to be lower among less educated Iranians, as opposed to uh, their more highly educated counterparts, 31% to 
lack of fi facing candidates and the government are among the most important, main, most important reasons listed by those who do not plan to participate in the election. Majority of Iranian disapproval of President job approval, I mean, President Raisi job performance, uh, it was uh, 65%. 65, President Raisi beats uh, for former Prime Minister Zarif in a hypothetical presidential election by a two to one margin in our poll, 30% to 60%, 16%. And Iranian youths have uh, used, I mean, those who are in the age of 18 to 29, uh, they have serious concern about their future. And we are gonna talk about it a little bit more. <clears throat> but let me go, uh, at, I mean, uh, to more findings, uh, dig into the results. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the first one is election turnout. Uh, so you know that the most important thing in, ele in election in Iran is turnout. So the government wants to have the more turnouts, and this this year and in the la in the uh, last presidential election we had a record low election ter turnout. So our record shows that our likely mo uh, likely uh, voter model show shows that at the time that thirty four percent of the Iranians are they they are going to cast a ballot in the elections and 66% is gonna be considered as non-voters. The thing is here is important that, so we know that based on the official result, the actual result shows us that 41% still is a uh, record low turnout in the parliamentary election in Iran. However, based on the, my uh, last piece, I mean, the analysis of province of Tehran in this election that I published yesterday, in Farsi it was actually, so my prediction uh, says that at the best, uh, the election turnout was 38%. And we had the lots of uh, invalid votes. I mean, the blank or invalid or that kind of things. The government, unfortunately, they don't reveal the kind of information that we need for that kind of invalid votes. But our uh, data shows that because of Tehran, Tehran province has a very huge role in election turnout and has an outlier in compared with the other provinces if you want to compare this election to the previous one. I mean, uh, uh, the election four years ago. But two things here are important. The first one is a, a, a turnout based on age, based on age. We know that, and it's not so, something surprisingly for me, that uh, young Iranian, Iranians, those who are in the age of 18 to 29 in this poll, so they are less likely to vote in the elections. And it's consistent over the last couple of years that I've conducted the polls in Iran or regarding the situation in Iran. In this poll, as you see here in this uh, chart, just 19% of the Iranians in this age group, 18 to 29, uh, I mean, based on the, uh, our result, voted as opposed to, for example, for, uh, 45% those who are in the age of 60 and more. So we can kind of see, think that this kind of thing that is very, it's not surprising for me, so it's, uh, and it's, we could predict that one. But something that's very surprising for me is the election turnout is predicted to be lower among less educated Iranians compared to their more highly educated counterparts. And less educated Iranians, I mean that those who have who uh, has not the uh, college education degree. I've, I remember in every poll I have conducted regarding Iran. So, or I was a part of the team, or at least I saw the results. Uh, we had a di direct opposite, uh, I mean, kind of, it's not association, but I would say relation. Meaning that those who are more educated, uh, least likely to vote in the election. But this, in this election, we can find that kind of uh, very surprising uh, thing that uh, I, I believe that we have to take a look at more deeply and find a way that, find the reasons that why it happens. Uh, some of the, I mean, I have some hypotheses, for example, because of a life, uh, uh, woman life freedom uprising in the in 2022, or some other uprising in 2017 and 2019, all of which involved many marginalized Iranians, uh, and including the, uh, those without access to college education. We know that based on some uh, official reports for those who imprisoned in this in these movements over the last couple of years, many of them were young, uneducated Iranians living in poor cities or counties. 
But as I mentioned, determining the exact cause causes of this trend is beyond the scope of this survey, but worth, worth to analyze more. The other thing is uh, some of the main reasons to for those who, I mean, in our uh, surveys, uh, we believe that they might not participate in the election. Uh, we asked them what's, uh, why the main reason that you might not participate in the election. And as you see here, those who said that we don't trust the candidates is ranked first with 20%. We had other options such as I don't trust the government, it's 17%. Our uh, votes doesn't matter. I have no reason to cast my ballot, and there are lots of other things. And one of them is uh, the uh, the economic issues. That is, uh, seven percent of the respondent said that. This kind of tell, tell us that why uh, people not might might not participate in the election and lack of confidence in the government or the candidate uh, as a whole. It's a it could be a reason that people uh, did not cast their ballot in the election. <clears throat> The other thing is present job approval. It's a very uh, interesting topic for me because I'm very interested to see how the people's view uh, regarding the president's performance change uh, over time. And as you see here, Mr. Raisi's job approval is 16, uh, is 32 percent, uh, which is not good. I wouldn't say that's a record, job, but it's very bad. His number worse is among the young Iranians who are in the age of 18 to 29, as, as, as you see here, just 24% of those those responded in this, in this age group approve of his performance. Uh, however, President, uh, uh, President Rice's approval is low. Uh, this poll represents a four-point uh, four improvement over our 2022 findings, it, uh, that it was 28%. It was... Uh, in, in, in his first year in the office that we conduct a poll and ask people if they approve or disapprove his job approval. This trend, as you see, is for President Raisi and President, President Rouhani. This, is a, this uh, red line here, left is for President Rouhani and the right is for President Raisi. And as, as I mentioned here, that's very uh, record low because we know that President Rouhani start his presidency in his first, I mean, first and a half year after his election, it, in 2023, I believe it was, he enjoyed 59% uh, approval for his performance. His best performance was 67% after the Iran and West uh, made an agreement, it's, which is called JPCOA, JCPOA, I can't remember to recall it, so whatever it is. Uh, so he, he had in his best shot at 67% approval and 18% disapproval, but at the end of his term, it's astonishing reversal. As you see here, he uh, with 67% uh, approval in Gulf to 18% just a month before the election uh, that President Raisi uh, uh, won that. At, the, at this time, President Raisi's favorability, he was, at the, he was the chief justice or head of judiciary at the, at the, at the time. He was favorability and I'm, uh, uh, I'm telling that it's favorability, not job approval. For president, for then uh, uh, head of judiciary, Mr. Raisi was around 51%. But as you see here, when he took the office in his, his first year, 28%, and now we have him in 32%. It's not good. And I can't remember any president in his first year in office or his, his first two years in office has that kind of uh, low job performance. Uh, the other uh, finding is the parliament job approval is low, is 30%. This is the first time that we uh, asked respond, our respondents about the parliament job approval at the end of this term. At the term, actually, it was 30%. It's not good, but we cannot compare it to previous uh, polls because we haven't asked this question in the past. Uh, the other topic that I'm very interested in, and we are going to have that, this kind of question in the future, is uh, uh, the kind of high political election matchup between uh, Mr. Raisi or any potential candidates. Here we have Mr. Uh, Zarif as his, as his country, I mean, uh, rival in the next presidential election, I mean, hypothetic, hypothetically. And as you see here, Mr. Raisi beats Mr. Zarif 30% to 16%. This is, I wouldn't say it's good or bad for either of them, but if we go to the 
uh, two years ago, when uh, we, uh, we asked the exact same question, Mr. Raisi had 60% as opposed to uh, Mr. Zarif with 11%. So it's a, it's a thing that is for Mr. Raisi at May 21, it's five times more. But here he is in a 30% to 16%. He doesn't, I mean, I've passed him and actually the majority of 50% as well. So it's a, it's a, it could be a bad thing for Mr. Raisi or, I mean, could any any rival, I mean, could have kind of hope that if he want to, uh, I mean, uh, go in on election and then uh, run against Mr. Raisi, he has a, I mean, I, I believe has a good shot, could have a good shot. And the other topic, other topic is in this uh, survey, we asked some questions regarding Iranian youth. And I, when I uh, talk about Iranian youth, I mean those who are in the age of 18 to 29. We asked them as respondents, what's the most important issue to them? So for example, marriage, unemployment, that kind of thing was very uh, popular among the respondents. However, we had six questions, as you see here in a five scale spectrum, actually for the scale spectrum and ask if the respondents agree or disagree with this statement. And for, for example, as you see here, when I uh, talk here, we, we uh, say that Iranians have serious concern about their future or Iranian youth have serious concern about their future. For one of the questions was Iranian youth do not see prosperity for their future in Iran. As you see here, 64% agree, I mean, completely agree, 12% agree and just uh, 15 and 5 is 20 percent uh, maybe disagree or completely disagree. The other question was, for example, government officials restrict the liberty of Iranian youth by interfering in their life. Here again, 48 percent agree. Iranian officials do not care about solving the issues that matter to the Iranian youth. 54 percent and for 16 percent is going to be 70, 70 percent agree. And one of the other things very important to me because I, we had that kind of same question last year. Iranian youth prefer to immigrate to other countries instead of living in Iran. As you see here, 68% agree, I mean, uh, completely or somewhat agree with this statement. And the result for Iranian youth, because this, this is the, this number is based on the whole population. If we segmentize this, divide, uh, this result based on the age group, we could see that, uh, I believe I have the, I don't have it here. Uh, more people, I mean, Iranian youth have more concern about this, this kind of thing. They want to immigrate to other countries. And the last one is government officials listen to the needs and ideas of Iranian uh, young Iranians or young people. And as you see here, 75% disagree. So this is the kind of question that we are going to ask I mean, in the next surveys, at least maybe in every other survey. So, and then we compare the result on the trend, so to see if there's any, there could be any change in the Iranian's behavior and Iranian belief about that kind of concern that Iranian youth might have in this for their future. So this is the survey methodology. So I'm not talking about this, this right now. So I hope I, the, I didn't pass my 10 minutes limit. So just very much, that's why I was very quick. Just wanna go to the findings. Thank you very much, Arash. This is extremely helpful and hopefully we will get to additional comments and observations that you may have. But before we move on to Merza, can I just ask you to contextualize how these surveys have been conducted and whether we need to take some of the responses with an additional grain of salt, knowing that some of the Iranians may be reticent about expressing their disagreements and negative sentiments toward the regime. That's true. I wouldn't say that it's not. So this is the kind of problem that any policy might have. Not just concern. The people lie. They might lie. So, and this is not just a problem in Iran. For example, I would say, I remember that it was in 2017 or 18, I was part of the poll asking people in, in, in the US, did you vote in the last presidential election in the US? And 80% said yes. We know that at the time, the election uh, turnout was, I believe, in 2016, around 60%. So as a pollster, we have to get rid of that kind of problem as much as we can. I wouldn't say that I'm uh, completely uh, sure that this 32%, for example, is job approval is exactly 32%, couldn't be more or less. I wouldn't say that. But as a pollster, we have some 
our I mean methodology to to get rid of uh, this these issues as as much as possible. Finding I mean based on our interviewers, the the the, the candor we have a candor measure indicator. We have a trust indicators. We have some kind of uh, crossing the uh, the the questionnaires and the questions in the questionnaire to find if there's any issues and then we are going to get rid of all all uh, uh, I mean responses that we do we believe that it's not valid in this questionnaire I believe we uh, removed more than sixty percent as far as I remember it should be here around somewhere sixty percent of the uh, sixty uh, uh, respondents because we believe that is we cannot rely on it so. Uh, that that's the thing that as a as a poster I can do as a poster I can do. The other thing is uh, we publish everything on our website. A everything I mean, even the raw data. If you go to the, our dashboard, you can see that, for example, for every single person, you can compare his his or her result with, uh, based on the other questions. It's not. Uh, it's very uh, tr transparent and. Uh, we welcome any any other people if you want to go through and then make their own analysis. They can do that. Our past uh, results, for example, for the presidential election, I remember a month before the election, uh, we predicted that definitely Mr. Rice is going to be a president. It was a month or a month and a half before the election. And at the time, some, I mean, uh, uh, political figures or some, some ones, I believe they they believe that it's not right. It's not correct. The poll result or maybe it has some kind of flaws because they believe that Mr. Raisi, uh, people afraid of telling people telling the uh, the uh, telling us that they might not vote for Mr. Raisi. But at the time he was popular. I know that he uh, has some problem. For example, for the he was a member of I don't know uh, the committee mag maybe the death committee in during the death committee death committee in during eighties charge 80s. of executions. Yes. Yeah. But at the time, I, I would say that President, uh, then head of judiciary or head of uh, head of judici judiciary, Mr. Raisi was popular, and he got the presidency. But now he's not. So that kind of things that we we, we just want to be transparent, make sure everything is. I mean, you as a as a uh, someone who want to have your analysis, they can you can do that. We publish the uh, raw data, transparent as much as possible. But Thank again. You. Our, our, as a pollster, I just want to make sure that we get rid of as much as possible I can. They, they these clues as much as possible I can. I wouldn't say that it's going to be 100% confident. Thank you very much for that explanation and um, clarification of your methodology. Uh, Merzad Burujerdi, let's turn to you. Um, I'm very interested in knowing your observations and your takeaways from this recent elections. Um, and also how these recent elections compared to the last elections that we have witnessed. Um, so please get us started on your on your findings. Sure. Thank you, Marjan, and thank you, Middle East Institute, for the uh, invitation to be with you today. So Arash talked about the poll results, um, and I have been, you know, gathering data uh, for uh, you know elections for the last forty year, forty four years. Uh, much of which is, by the way, available on the website that I have created called Iran Data Portal. You can see that and election results from this round will also be put there very shortly. But let me address, try to address two main questions. Number one, did people stay away in this election compared to the previous ones? And if so, what are you know some of the explanations, theoretical and empirical, that one can have for this uh, uh, phenomenon? Okay, so um, based on uh, the Iranian government's uh, statistics, we knew that 60 million eligible voters uh, were out there, 30 million men, 30 million women, and the state said that the turnout rate was 25 million, um, which is around 41%. Um, if we look at the average voter turnout rate for the last 11 rounds of parliamentary elections, that was uh, that rate was 58%. So this is really a noticeable decline, 41 compared to 58 for the previous rounds. And of course, of this 41%, according to government's own um, uh, explanation, 8% of these votes were spoiled votes, right? These were people, you know, um, leaving the uh, thing blank, uh, illegible writing, uh, voting for non-candidates, Phenomena like that. But anyhow, the Iranian government has a method of counting 
a spoil votes as part of the uh, participation rate. And therefore, you can see how the 41% is inflated even in, in that sense. All right. So this really therefore means that we have seen the lowest level of participation by the Iranian uh, public over the last uh, you know, uh, 44 years, even compared to four years ago in 2020, right? That, that turnout rate was 43%. So that means you know, we have gone down based on official stats from 43 to 41 for, for this round. Now, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is um, um, collecting data about voter turnout in various provinces of Iran. Because frankly, I think unless we understand what happens in the various you know, provinces, our knowledge of Iran will be rather uh, you know, uh, incomplete if all the emphasis is, is on what's happening on Tehran. Tehran might be the political capital, but it's not the, the whole country, right? And so when I look at the data, again, some interesting facts jump out at you. Based on the official, uh, uh, data, every one of the 31 provinces of Iran had a lower voter turnout rate than their average for the last 44 years. Let me repeat, every province had a lower turnout rate this time than for the last 44 years. If I could actually, um, maybe I could you know, um, share my screen for one second and show you this data. This, uh, let's see where am I? What, while you're doing this, can you explain the difference between the provinces and Tehran and why this low voter turnout is significant? Sure, yeah. Can you see my screen now for the provinces? Uh, no, we are seeing files. Oh, okay, all right. And they're very organized. Sorry. <laughs> all right, for, forget it. I, 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 you know, just, just take my word for it that based on the data, this is really what we are seeing in terms of um, the, the um, um, uh, okay, okay. based on you know, what, what, what has been happening. So the question really here is, is the following. Um, every, every province has been voting less than the last uh, 44 years. 17 of these provinces, which means 55% of them, have had lower turnout rates, right, than the last, uh, you know, four decades. So Sistan, Baluchistan, for example, is the one that, as you know, has been the most active province in the women life freedom movement in Iran. Sistan, Baluchistan experienced a 17% drop compared to the 2020 majlis elections. Tehran turnout rate was declared to be 26%, right, which is around the same rate officially than what it was in 2020. So this means that the average for the last 44 decades has been 44%, but we are down to uh, 26% for, for Tehran. All but four of the top uh, 31 uh, front runners in Iran's provinces received single digit votes. This is really significant, meaning that people did not get more than 10% of the votes. Even Tehran's highest vote getter, right? Um, a cleric received something around 5% of the 1.8 million eligible voters in, in Tehran. If you look at the simultaneous assembly of experts elections, again, the 16 top individuals from Tehran, none of them got more than 888,000 votes, whereas you know 1.8 million people supposedly Voted, so it shows you there is really some real discontent with the quality of the candidates, and as a result, in in the country as a whole, for the first time ever, sixteen percent of the candidates now have to be decided in a runoff election that will be held two months from now. Okay, this has never happened again. Out of the two hundred ninety seats in the parliament, only two hundred forty five were. Um, a uh, you know elected in the first round and the rest have to be you know in in runoff uh, elections. Now let's address the question of why voters stayed away because I think again both the poll that Arash shared and the uh, data that I'm sharing with you shows that uh, definitely the voters you know uh, stayed away uh, and, and I think you know in order to really understand that 
we need to think about the following factors. One, broadly speaking, from a political sociology perspective, I think it's fair to say that uh, whereas the life world of most Iranians has changed, thanks to urbanization, thanks to higher literacy, et cetera, thanks to the fact that, you know, after four decades, the, revolution, uh, the revolutionary zeal has declined, right? Um, you know, you cannot be in a state of permanent revolution all the time. And again, as Arash's data pointed out, particularly that sense of alienation among the youth is quite noticeable. We also had the phenomena of the expatriate media, you know, calling for a, a serious boycott. And I think cumulatively, all these factors contributed to the fact that, you know, these record number of people have stayed away. In addition, we have rather depressive economic conditions in the country, right? The purchasing power of people have declined, not rather seriously. We have seen in you know, a decline of the stock market. We have seen the skyrocketing of rents and, you know, prices of automobiles uh, and backbreaking costs of essential items, you know, sugar, meat, eggs, you name it. On top of that, you have, of course, the corruption and mismanagement by the state that, again, have seriously chipped away of, at the state's uh, political capital. You have the suppression of the mass uh, uh, uprising of uh, last year, 2022. And, you know, that has, of course, left the, you know, bad taste in the mouth of many uh, of, of, of Iranians. Uh, so that, that's another contributing factor. In addition to all this, one can say, you know, there is a serious case of disqualification of more attractive candidates. Look, this time around, the, there were record number of candidates who registered more than ever before. 24,829 candidates registered for majlis election. And interestingly enough, 73% of them, or 15,000, were approved, so, right? This is, a, this is an approval rate that was much higher than previously. So you would assume if there were more candidates and more approval, therefore participation rate should be higher, right? Well, this is where the logic you know, gets screwed in the following sense, because most of these candidates were from the conservative camp. Indeed, according to one uh, report that was published in Iran, uh, of the 15,000 who were approved, only we could find only 165 so-called moderates in the slate that people could vote for throughout the country, right? Only 165 individuals. So, we know that many of the more attractive candidates were disqualified, including 26 members of the sitting uh, majlis, the 11th round of majlis here. So the incumbency rate in the next round in the 12th majlis is going to be less than 50% for sure. And of course, these candidates, right, because they do, do not really belong to a political party, none of them almost put forward any type of serious plan right, uh, about how they are going to be tackling the, the, the country's serious, serious economic, political, cultural uh, problems. And on top of everything else, right, we have the governments or the regimes really rather flagrant uh, use of propaganda, instrumentalist use of, you know, celebrities, athletes, etc., cetera, for, for, for their purposes. So I think as a result of all this, we can now talk about two important developments. One is the, the regime's rather serious crisis of legitimacy, right? So if you think about the, the fact that Ayatollah uh, Khamenei as, is at a rather advanced age and he might be, uh, uh, you know, uh, disappearing from the scene, right? Uh, sooner or later, perhaps over the next, you know, five to seven years, etc. Then the question becomes, what will remain for this state in terms of you know, political capital? What is the opportunity cost that they have suffered right, as a result of this type of bargain with the citizenry, where basically the government says, you know, I, I only want one political viewpoint to be out there, the conservative variety, and, and we don't listen to anything else. right? So that alienation, that divorce, that political divorce between the citizenry and the public really becomes quite important. The second point that I think is also important, and I will end on this note, is the following. Okay, 
if predictions about the government's demise um, are inaccurate, which I certainly believe uh, uh, is inaccurate. I don't expect this regime to be toppled anytime soon. I think anyone who, who thinks otherwise might be you know, uh, more dreaming than looking at the political facts. This regime is going to be with us for some time to come, right? And as such, this really raises the following point. For the opposition, what do, what do we do, right? Do we continue with the practice of boycotting elections, knowing all too well that as we saw here, as we saw in the last round, this only is tantamount to really opening the field only to conservative candidates. And frankly, every time, more radical variety of conservatives coming and taking power. This 12th parliament that is going to come to power in Iran is perhaps the most conservative you know, uh, uh, in the country's history, right? And therefore it has ramifications for its foreign policy, for its domestic policy, for you know, rights of women, minorities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think this is a question that everyone in the opposition really needs to, to wrestle with. Uh, again, I, I pointed out so that I'm, I'm quite crystal clear, I'm not advocating participation in elections, but I'm saying this is really a serious issue that is going to have ramifications. If on the one hand, we call for boycott after boycott, and on the other hand, conservatives take over every instrument of power in the country without any, you know, even sweating, right? And therefore, what is going to be the long-term ramifications of this type of phenomena happening in the country for, for a long term? So let me stop here and um, uh, th thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you so much for your um, analysis and for your sobering um, and uh, conclusions. We will get back to you with some more questions, but I want to turn to Alex. Um, you have heard um, the polls, the opinion surveys, and, and you have your own observations. Um, Mr. Bujardi was referring to um, some of the disqualifications that happened. Why don't you share with us your general takeaways from the recent elections, but also um, hone in on some of these disqualifications of candidates that took place prior to these elections, and what do they mean? Do they mean uh, it, do they indicate anything about the level of control um, that? Khamenei may have in his hands? Um, and uh, what are some of the factors that may be pushing the younger generation toward political mobilization and any, you know, any potential reform that may be in view? Alex? Thank you, Marjan. Great, great to join you, Merzad and Arash. Wonderful to be with you all. Uh, look, I, I'll take a step back. Uh, I tend to be much more, uh, in many ways, cynical when it comes to the sort of utility of having elections in the Islamic Republic. I think the track record speaks for itself in terms of what elected officials are actually able to do. Uh, again, I'm a cynical voice on that. I, I think on strategic issues, elected officials do not have much say. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Take the words of people who actually serve the Islamic Republic. And they've come out and said, you know, our hands were tight. We couldn't do anything. So uh, we really need to keep that in mind in terms of the utility of elections. Much of this is a legacy of the revolution of 1979. It could have been a, a straightforward theocracy uh, back in 79. But for the political conditions of the day, they ended up having to compromise and have a Republican aspect to this. And that Republican aspect has forced this uh, Islamic Republic to hold multiple of elections, probably one of the countries in the world with most elections held. But these elections don't really result in major change on issues that average Iranians care about, but it's domestic or, or foreign uh, issues. And again, I'm, I'm not saying anything that's a secret that is pretty much admitted to by folks inside uh, um, the Iranian uh, political system. And that's the reality that essentially was the writing on the wall and why the young demographic have given up showing up and voting. Why bother? Why waste their time? Why play the game that is already predetermined by uh, uh, the Supreme Leader's office, uh, by the Revolutionary Guards generals, who then use the various vetting processes, such as the Guardian Council notably, to keep out anybody who might have a different idea, who might want to decide to chart a different course. So, you know, it's not that the Iranian people haven't wanted to uh, pursue the idea of gradual change. They have. Uh, and um, 
when they did, most notably in 97, with the election of Mohammed Khatami or the 2000 elections for the Majlis, overwhelmingly reformist candidate. As you just heard, uh, I think the numbers that we heard from Mayor Sud were about 15,000 approved to run, 165, 165 of those were potentially reformist. And when we say in reformist, we're not talking about people who come from the street who question the Islamic Republic's existence. These are reformists relative to others in the system. And only 165 out of 15,000. So this gives you a sense of how this system is so micro-engineered to provide a show so the leadership in the Islamic Republic can claim legitimacy if they really wanted to have a political system that reflected the wishes of the people, obviously you wouldn't have mass disqualifications. And number two, I should add, of the 15 or so thousand approved to run, 90% were men. Uh, I believe the number for women were 12%, uh, 88 versus 12%. So again, there are all sorts of issues that one can point to. But Marjan, let me take a step back and look at this from a sort of a macro level. What does this all mean to me uh, as an Iran watcher? I think what Ali Khamenei and the, uh, his office, it's not him, the individual, but it's inner circle and the generals and the Revolutionary Guards, what they basically did here in this last election is what they did in the in the 2021 elections with Ibrahim Raisi, who would have never become president of Iran had it not been delivered to him on a silver platter. The man just didn't have a base, uh, but nobody else was allowed to run. And here you have uh, President Raisi, who I suspect will also be reelected in next year's time. So I, I think Khamenei and the Revolution Guards have power consolidation in mind, not reflecting the wishes of the people. Uh, the system as a whole today is not about uh, expanding legitimacy uh, and, and broadening the base of support. That's not their priority. The priority is to make sure the minority that has the guns, that has the money, that runs the institutions, that they're with the regime that they don't have defection from the system. That's what keeps Khamenei and the guards uh, up at night. And that, for that purpose, I think the, these elections are delivered. Uh, there are no surprises. Nobody's going to walk into the next match less and, uh, or the assembly of experts and have any sort of questions that might be uncomfortable for uh, Ali Khamenei and the guards' uh, leadership. You know, even folks like Hassan Rouhani, an individual who was a member of the Assembly of Experts for 24 years, on top of that, he was president for eight years, he was suddenly told he wasn't qualified any longer. I mean, I can not I can only think of a handful of people who've been part of this system as long as Islamic Republic has been around, uh, as, as has Hassan Rouhani. And here suddenly, this political system literally now having chewed him up threw him out and said, we don't need you anymore. Why? Because he might have asked awkward questions in the assembly of experts whose main job really is to rubber stamp the next Supreme leader. They'll be in office for eight years and um, Khamenei is gonna be turning 85 in the next few months. There's a likelihood he might not survive the next assembly of experts and it's eight years in office. So Khamenei didn't want to take any chances. And um, he has made sure that even this assembly of experts, that is supposed to be a forum of a learned clerics who make sure that the system is Islamic, today is made up of individuals. Very few of us can even mention one or two prominent names in there because the prominent names, even among the cleric, clerics are gone. They're, they've been uh, put aside. And that's basically the story from what I can from what I, what I can tell. It's about consolidation of power. It's about making sure that there are no surprises when it comes to the succession process. Um, and, you know, who sits in the majlis today? I mean, the biggest of stories in terms of who sits in the majlis, and I think Mirza touched on this, is the fight among the hardliners. I mean, you know, there are individuals like Hamid Desai, a pretty hardline cleric who, yes, he will once in Majlis, he will continue to say very outlandish things as he has done in the past when he's been a member of the Majlis. But the reality is Hamid Desai and these hardliners really don't have the say over strategic issues like U.S.-Iran relations. They can shout as much as they want in the Majlis. Uh, but they're not going to be able to influence policy. Uh, and that's, again, uh, just to emphasize yet again, the hugely limited powers of elected officials when it comes to key issues that Iranians are uh, concerned about, foreign policy, how to deal with the economic issues, which is very much linked to the state of the Iranian foreign policy and the sanctions. Corruption. I mean, which member of the Majlis can deal with corruption? None of them dare even speak it. 
So, you know, what you have is people like, um, you know, the the the, the father-in-law of uh, Mujtaba Khamenei, the son of Khamenei, Ghulam Ali Haddad Adel. Every four years, they bring the philosopher Haddad Adel out to create some excitement election time. Uh, I don't know what the man stands for. I only see Haddad Adel when it's election time. But I can tell you, if I was an Iranian member of that young demographic, I will look at Haddad Adel and people of that uh, ilk and say, what do you actually have that resonates with me in terms of ideas? And that's that's where the Islamic Republic is at right now. So again, to go back to a final point, I'll stop. It's not about getting legitimacy. He couldn't care less. Ali Khamenei couldn't care less about legitimacy. He tried that in 97 and 2000, and he knows he doesn't have the people behind him. And he doesn't want to go in the direction of trying to get him behind him. He has no interest. His interest is about making sure the system is in order, the day he comes when he dies, that he can pass on the, uh, the, the, the torch to whoever he trusts the most in terms of preserving his legacy. Uh, and again, if we could talk about that, if there's interest, but that's about it. So the minority that runs the Islamic Republic in, in Iran with the guns, with the money, with the power and control of the prisons and all the rest of it, all they're doing right now is making sure that they can keep the base that is still supporting the system in place so they can carry on. Uh, one thing that Mehrzad and I might disagree, I agree with him in the sense that people have these notions that this Islamic Republic is going to suddenly overnight collapse. That's not going to happen. It's a much more uh, stronger state than people are, are willing to give it credit for. But what we don't know, and again, that was something Mehrzad said, is the opposition has plenty of options, whether it's inside or outside. What they're lagging miserably is mobilizing themselves and coming up with a credible agenda to push back. Because if you don't push back, then you're going to get the same thing every election cycle. Khamenei is going to play the, the, the system, the game of pretending that elections matter, that he's a, he has legitimacy. Uh, well, we, everybody else who is independently looking at, at this will recognize actually that's not the case. The, the elections and the ballot box is no longer, if it's ever been the case, how you bring about change in the, in the Islamic Republic. So that's my big takeaway. I'll, I'll I could go on and, and talk about some of these other issues, but um, let me stop here, Marjan, and, and love to um, come back to some of these issues perhaps later on. Uh, and we will definitely do that. I, I want to give Arash a chance to jump in here if you have any observations on um, on, on this discussion that, that can help to, you know, may, maybe through other surveys that you have done, and especially with, from the perspective of the, of the younger generation. Um, is um is are we uh, are, are the people handing over the leadership of the country to the conservatives by boycotting the elections or or do you see it differently and then we will come back to you again Mersad. Uh, the one thing that i could say and i'm a hundred i'm kind of very pretty much sure about it is that so let's assume that in this election some of the I mean, uh, the, those who call themselves, I mean, Islah Taliban I mean, front runner, reformist front runners, or that kind of uh, translation we can go through it. So, such as Mr. Taizade, it could have run. I'm telling you, the turnout wouldn't uh, get much more than 42, 43%. Because people, because of any reason they don't they didn't want to vote and because of any reason that we can talk about it they have they i mean they don't trust the government and the regime as a whole so the the question is here is not about the boycotting the election the question is about the the government cannot do its job i mean the governing and it's not uh, exactly political for example, to those who live in urban area, rural area, those who live in uh, small cities and counties, they don't care about the, what's the politics of Iran as a whole. They don't care about the reformists or principalists or, I mean, that kind of issues that we have. Of course, I mean, some uprising in the past, the, the, the way that the government dealt with that, that kind of problem, it, it does matter, of course. But those people, they, they, their main concern is they can, I mean, they want to have the very normal life. And if they do vote for some candidates and don't get that kind of thing that they, they 
I mean, prefer to have or expected that kind of things, they don't vote. And this is a problem these days. I don't say that, for example, the boycotting is a very important issue. I mean, it's a very important and make a very important role in this election. I, I won't say that, for example, the, uh, the oppositions of in, inside the country or outside the country, reformists inside the country or some uh, opposition groups outside the countries, they made that kind of things that they made that people don't vote. People, they don't care these days. I mean, in the previous polls we conducted the last year, we asked people, how do you believe that President Raisi, for example, can do, I mean, uh, can solve the issues matter to you? Just 20, 25% says that, said that at the time that we are completely, uh, have kind of confidence to him that he can do that. That's a, that's a problem. Uh, I wouldn't say that, for example, in a uh, terminology of the political science, it's a collapsed government. It might be, I don't know. But uh, the government, the go Iran, I mean, the, the whole system cannot govern. And that's a problem. And the, uh, the other thing is, so uh, in this situation, and I have a very, I mean, it, co it could be a harsh statement, but I believe that the government these days, they don't, they do not want the higher turnout. The high turnout is not give the grant for the government to, for, to do whatever they want to do. For the for the uh, for the country's future and the government, I mean the top level, at the those who on uh, on a uh, to make final decisions. So and I believe that they don't want to. If for example, if they wanted to have a little bit more uh, water turnout, they could do that. So forty one percent, they could go a little bit more than forty two for forty three percent, at least half a percent more than. Uh, election during President Rouhani's administration. This is the kind of thing that some people believe that they want to have that kind of things, but the government as a whole, they don't want uh, turnouts, a high, high turnouts, and I have some reason for that one so beyond the scope of this panel. I can talk if uh, anyone wants to discuss or have their opinion, but that's a problem. It's boycotting is not a problem. The issue is governing these days, I believe. Let me thank you very much. Let me turn to you, Merzad, um, and and I want to hear your reactions both to what uh, Arash just said and also what Alex was sharing about the fact that um, you know um, th this 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 direction of um, voter boycott uh, may be actually creating a, a division among the hardliners. Um, and then the second part to that is even if you think that. Um, this this is just going to embolden the the conservatives. Could we assume that uh, it is even possible to govern a country with a population that is that sixty percent of the population is under the age of thirty, and they are you know as the statistics show they are dissatisfied with the level of representation that they're receiving. How is it possible, even if all the power is consolidated uh, among the conservatives? Um, how do you think it's even possible to govern a, a country um, that is showing by their inaction and in the lack of voting that they do not see this government as a legitimate entity? How would it even be sustainable for the Islamic Republic, even assuming that they are attaining more consolidated power in their own hands? Sure. Very good question. Let me actually start with, with that as, as a way of framing my response to some of my colleagues. Um, look, uh, theoretically speaking, I look at a uh, regime such as the one uh, in Iran, right, as electoral authoritarian regimes. Um, and for, for reasons that um, Alex was pointing out, yes, you know, uh, they, uh, the, the supreme leader, the non-elected bodies absolutely, absolutely trump the power of elected uh, institutions in Iran, right? We know what, and they are quite, you know, um, non-transparent. They are not responsive to the needs of citizenry, et cetera. But nonetheless, they are keeping this electoral component as a way of you know, buying their legitimacy. That's why you know, they go into this whole propaganda campaign uh, to, to emphasize why people should come out. Look, one can dismiss and say, therefore, elections are irrelevant. You know, why, why are we even wasting uh, energy uh, uh, paying attention to them? I think that's where we can go wrong. 
as a political scientist, I think studying the voting behavior of the citizenry in any society is important. And in Iran, in particular, for the reasons mentioned. Let me give you some anecdotes, right? So that we can really appreciate the magnitude of this issue. Based on the data that I have gathered, one of Iran's least developed provinces, actually I used to live there, Kokiliye and Buyer Ahmad, right? Has an average voter turnout rate over the last 44 years of 81%, which is the highest in the country. Whereas a province such as al you know, right adjacent to Tehran, you know, including cities like Karaj, et cetera, has the lowest percentage rate of 39%. You think about the difference between 39 and 81, and you ask yourself, how is it that the least developed province, one of the least developed provinces, right, has such a high turnout, but one of the more advanced ones has such a low one, okay? Or let me give you another example. In this round of election, the Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Ali Buff, received 64% less votes than he garnered four years ago. 64% less despite being on the media every day, almost every day, right, as the Speaker of Parliament. Or another prominent casualty of the election was Mr. Sadegh Larijani, a former Chief Justice, current head of the Expediency Council, he decides to go and run for election from the province of Mazandaran, which has five seats in the Assembly of Experts, and they needed, you know, uh, sorry, they, they needed four seats, and there were five candidates. So he assumed he will be a shoe in right, to get elected once again to the Assembly of Experts from Mazandaran. He comes last among five and fails to get elected. What does that tell you? Right about what this type of voting behavior by 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 the by the citizen. Look, I am not making the argument that um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, boycott is the main argument. As I think Arash and Alex have pointed out, it is absolutely a very serious case of alienation, particularly among the youth. Right, I, and I and I made references to it. Look, in Iran, what we have seen over the last four decades is what I described a revolution of rising expectations, thanks to three factors, right? Urbanization, greater literacy, and the median age of a young population. The, the ceiling for people's expectation has gone up, whereas the government has not been able to deliver, right, on those needs, whether it's housing, whether it's employment, you know, uh, uh, civil freedoms, et cetera, et cetera. So that crisis of legitimacy is, is quite real. It, it, it's serious. But I don't think we are talking about a failed state. This is an incompetent regime for sure, right? But I won't call it in the category of, you know, Haiti. This is not a failed state. It's a still but is it sustainable? It is sustainable. And look, there is, when it, again, if we borrow some insights from the literature of political science, right? There is an argument about longevity of regimes that are born through a revolution. And Iran is one, China is one, right? Cuba is another one. We have, you know, they might not be ideal. They, they, you, by any metric of efficiency, popularity, et cetera, they might fail, right? But nonetheless, they stay in power. So I think we need to so somewhat adjust our lenses, right? So in my view, the, the failure of the women, uh, you know, uh, life freedom movement uh, is only the last indication of a series of popular protests over the last four decades that appear because this is a crisis-ridden state. They cannot solve the problem. So naturally, since there are no possible venues for venting for political opposition, no political parties to really speak of, et cetera, naturally dissent finds its way into the streets. People come out to the streets. Th that's not the part that we are contesting. The part that I think really deserves our attention as students of social science is to ask ourselves this troubling question of why is it that social movements appear, whether it's the green movement or the mass movement, right? And they have all ended with the same conclusion. They have all been defeated. What's going on, right? And I think that's really the million dollar question that as analysts, right? We need to move toward uh, contemplating, answering, 
not through resort to polemics and rhetorics and emotions, because you know you can have plenty of those, but that's not going to, at the end of the day, answer the problem confronting us. Let's get to Alex to answer this question. Alex, why did the reform movement fail? Um, and how was it different from the women life freedom movement that, um, you know, some people argue that it is still alive, um, but why don't you share with us your observations and also any other responses you might have to Marcel's points. Sure. Look, I mean, the reform movement, the big difference between the green movement and, and the uh, massa movement, obviously, is one emerged from within the regime. It, it was came from the ranks of the operatives of the Islamic Republic, people who had most of those people who were in, in play in 2009 when the Green Movement was uh, born, they had been, uh, you know, original stakeholders and participants in the revolution of 1979. Uh, Massa movement, most, most of, um, number one, it didn't emerge from the from the state, from the regime, it, from the streets level up. It was anger at that younger demographic primarily. And, uh, you know, it... Um, uh, that's that's how I see the, the the big difference, and I don't. When I think about the reform movement and the green movement, if I could answer the question this way, one is probably dead for good. Uh, it's now, uh, you know, uh, something we need to read about in history uh, books. The green movement, that generation of leaders, who is left? I mean, you could say, arguably, with the death of Rafsanjani back in two thousand seventeen, the rem the re what became. What uh, Rafson Johnny, who was never really a reformist, but he kind of at, at the end of his life he could claim to be the God uh, Father or the figurehead that that you know these reform moderate uh, factions figures could sort of coalesce around. And by his death in 2017, nobody's been able to fill his big shoes. Essentially, I know Hassan Rouhani tried; uh, he has failed. Uh, I mean, one of the things about Hassan Rouhani, which kind of links to 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 our, our conversation, is. This man, who I just pointed out earlier, was big part of the Islamist system from day one. President for eight years, member of the Majlis, member of the Assembly of Experts, national security advisor to the Supreme Leader himself for, for many years. And he's disqualified. And nobody said anything. Nobody. Nobody cared. Nobody from the regime came to his defense. Certainly, Iranian population couldn't care less. Because why? Because this uh, Hassan Rouhani got himself elected in these very limited elections that they have in Iran. Nonetheless, once people had a choice, they elected him. Did he deliver? On what point did he actually deliver? People will point to the nuclear agreement of 2015, but we all know Hassan Rouhani couldn't have done it without the support of, of Ali Khamenei, who in 2015 was really starting to, to panic about the impact of the sanctions, as he should have. And he sort of signed off and they had a deal. He could not have done it without the Revolutionary Guards and the Office of the Supreme Leader being on board. Um, so the reform movement, again, to, to go back to something I say, they had an opportunity to stand up, to challenge, to speak loudly, to criticize. To some extent, some of them did back in 99, in 2009, and we know what happened to them. Uh, they got their wings clipped. Um, some of them left the country, and the ones who stayed are more or less silent. They're not really factors. They're not you know, uh, the kind of characters that the, the regime in Tehran is worried about right now, they got them under control, which takes us to the Ma Maso movement. This is raw anger. This is on a street level. If this is, if they're going to come back, I mean, we've seen the trajectory of the last half a decade to a decade. Protests in Iran are becoming more frequent. They used to be parts of Tehran. Now they're happening nationwide. The country is, I think Mersa just said it, extremely liter uh, literate compared to before. I mean, social media, the role of social media. You know, something happened somewhere in a hospital like just this last week where a cleric uh, is uh, is uh, harassing a young woman because of her hair showing. And he's this is captured on video. And within literally a day or two, you have a movement born. This is the state of affairs. Uh, and the regime has, for its own reasons, decided to turn women, a half of Iran's population, into subjects of political 
you know, uh, to fear the, the, the women of Iran. That's essentially what the veil policy is all about. And I just don't know if they have the resources to be able to police 40 million women, vast majority of whom were against mandatory hijab. So my point with the Mahsa movement is that's the future. I can't predict the future because it's not organized. It's angry more than anything else. It's angry about everything that they see in society from the corruption, the hypocrisy, the failed foreign policy. But again, it, it, it will come out. Um, it has come out in recent years, a number of occasions. The regime has each time been able to uh, successfully repress it. But that doesn't mean they're going to be able to continue to suppress it each time it comes out because it's coming out more and more often. And it doesn't necessarily need to have one single leader for it to sort of sustain itself and have a momentum where we'll keep going without having necessarily a direction. And, you know, we've seen examples of that in the region. We've seen countries in the Middle East where things get out of control and there is no leadership, but there is civil war. That is that ought to be everyone's worst, um, uh, you know, nightmare that the regime lets things get out of hand so much so that the, uh, you know, the the unitary state of Iran and it's uh, the, the um, unity of the countries that put put at risk. I mean, some of the provinces that see most of the anger uh, against the regime are on the peripheries, Baluchistan, Kurdistan, Khuzestan. Uh, the regime doesn't have a, a um, agenda to deal with that. So, um, look, you know, I see I see uh, former foreign minister Javad Zarif is making the rounds these days, giving wonderful speeches. If he really wanted to change things, I think many of those young Iranians would uh, turn RH numbers uh, when he was showing us Raisi versus Zarif. You know, Zarif could turn things around if he decided tomorrow to get on a flight Playing, get out of the country and actually start saying what is what is on his mind and, and speak uh, the truth about how the Islamic Republic operates. And it's not me being emotional. That, that's basically what Zarif is trying to do. But he's limiting himself in Iran, uh, pretending that perhaps he could be a presidential election in 2025. Um, and, but then again, even if he wasn't a presidential candidate and even if he was allowed to win, surely he, he's been around long enough to realize even then, his powers to actually bring about serious change are limited. Just ask Mohammad Khatami. Just ask Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Just ask Hassan Rouhani. I mean, when when was the last time an Iranian elected official or even president was able to bring about major change going over the head of Ali Khamenei? Nothing major on the uh, on that front is going to happen while Ali Khamenei is alive. Once he's gone, the leadership in the Revolutionary Guards can make a decision. Do they want to stay the course? Do they want, actually want to go back and find a way to uh, legitimize themselves in a different way? There are options they can pursue. One is to you know focus on Iran and focus le much, much less about the world out there, the region. Uh, but these are decisions they have to make. They, they are not there yet. Ali Khamenei looks pretty good for 84-year-old. And we've just seen him uh, micromanage yet another election. Uh, but let's not pretend these elections matter more than they actually do. Thank you. Um, let me ask all of you, um, may maybe you can shed some light on this. And, you know, given that now we have this, uh, this, this uh, majlis for several more years, um, can they actually even pretend to listen to the desire and wills of the populace? And um, do we expect them to um, vote on any issues of interest and um, and th that would improve the well-being of the of the society, or are the decisions going to be made still at the Beit al Rahbari with uh, with with Khamenei behind closed doors? Do we believe at all that even to just uh, um, appeal to the population, they're going to come up with some decisions? that will look good inside the country and also maybe garner some legitimacy externally. If, if I could start, I would say, uh, look, when I look at the numbers, most of these folks were elected with really um, a very small percentage of the votes, as I, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, I don't really expect them to be taking any type of uh, serious steps about addressing the country's problems. Uh, these are a bunch of yes men and yes women. Uh, there is a you know a few of them uh, females in in the coming uh, uh, majlis. Um, interestingly enough, 
the tenth majlis or the ninth, I forgot which one, basically deprived itself of some serious rights that they had, i.e. looking into institutions under the supreme leader. They said, we don't want that. Right? So in other words, the majlis voted to make itself more irrelevant in the larger scheme of things here. Right? And if we see anything uh, you know, from the 11th majlis, that is the outgoing majlis, right? uh, basically all they did was to you know, adopt a policy of tit for tat with the US Congress when it comes to the nuclear negotiations. They, they were the ones that passed some of these you know, uh, uh, toughly worded language about you know, uh, the conditions under which there can be conditions, how we can retaliate against any type of you know, US move, et cetera, et cetera, regarding, regarding sanctions. So looking at the bios of these individuals, as I have been doing you know, uh, for the last two decades, no, I, I'm not really holding my breath that uh, anything uh, serious will come out of uh, this bunch of folks. Arash, what are your thoughts? I have the same. I'm nothing. Uh, nothing more to explain. This is Dr. Bourgeois, the, uh, I mentioned everything. So the magic doesn't matter these days. So all the only thing. I mean, the, I can have a statement that the most important thing in the future of the country is uh, what would happen after uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei, and this is the most important single independent variable, and anything is dependent on that. So. That's that's why I don't believe that the majlis does matter. But the, the other thing is we have two fractions of the principles in the majlis in this the current one. They might have <coughs> sorry some contradictions, and maybe with the eye toward the the next supreme leader in Iran, that's true. <clears throat> but this is a I wouldn't say civil war; it's an internal war during among the principles, and uh, so they're gonna continue until one of them take control of everything, I believe. Thank you. I want to remind everyone that you can submit your questions in the Q&A feature of Zoom. Um, there was, a, um, I'm going to turn to Alex for the same question. And there is one question from the Zoom that we will get to as well. Um, Alex. Yeah, no, I, I imagine, I just say, you know, on the majlis, these people who run for majlis, uh, you know, from where I don't have the hard data, uh, but this is just, looking at the debate inside of Iran, looking at the Iranian, uh, you know, state of affairs inside, uh, it's very clear that our rivalries, again, to Arash's point, among the, 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 the so-called hardliners, we shouldn't use the word conservative in the case of, since we're sitting here in the United States and our conservative friends will get upset, so we have to re refer to them as hardliners. So these hardliners are going to be the, having the biggest political fight among themselves. There is nobody else to fight really at this moment. Uh, but and, and among those majlis deputies, I mean, there is always a fight about the lower level uh, money available that, that goes around. So yes, people want to take money back to their provinces and counties where they come from. Uh, that's that's one of the ways the regime has been able to maintain some degree of legitimacy in the eyes of pockets around the country that look to the central government for to to for for money, and that is that is basically what they're doing. But they're not going to be rocking the boat uh, by asking really uncomfortable questions or challenging the, the the key two key powers in in the Islamic Republic, the office of the supreme leader, and the powers of the revolutionary guards. Um, I, I, I do think the issue of succession and going forward, I mean, this has now been a, a, been with us for a number of years now. If you go back, the, the last time Iran had a succession process, it lasted over 10 years. You could argue from the day Ayatollah Khomeini arrived from Paris, given his advanced age at the time, to the day he actually died in 89, 89 10 years later. For those 10 years, the country, the, the regime was trying to Various players were jockeying for 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 power, making sure they got um, the right end of the stick once Khomeini was was gone. And um, the same sort of thing has been going on for a number of years in terms of what comes after Khomeini. So there is all sorts of uh, jockeying going on. Um, we know of, for example, the the, the fight that's not you know, used to be hitting not so much more. Ibrahim Raisi and his circle against Mohammad Bagher Qalibov, the speaker of the Majlis, who's likely going to be the speaker again. Um, you know, there's the issue of what Mujtaba Khamenei, the second son of Khamenei, will be 
will he be a candidate to take over from his father? The father has said he doesn't want a succession like that. But what I'm saying is so much of this is about raw power and about the death of Khamenei. Please do not anticipate anybody in Iran to sit right now and plan ahead in terms of how do we turn the page with the Americans? How do we fix the nuclear issue? How do we change our politics on Israel or our support for the uh, proxy network and militant Islam in the region? None of those things have been debated right now because the most important issue is first, you got to secure the first prize, which is if there is going to be another supreme leader, that's what you want. So that's what the fight will be about in the foreseeable future. And in the meantime, what the regime clearly hopes it can do is to sell enough oil to keep that small minority that keeps the regime intact fed. That's what they're doing. And hoping, and this is their big risk that they're taking, hoping that they can use uh, repression to keep the rest of the society in, in that angry Iranian population, um, you know, a, a, a under under their thumb and, and make sure they don't um, come out in the streets in a way that the regime loses control. So that's how I see the foreseeable future going forward. I really think the succession process is going to be almost an all um, energy consuming affair in, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. We have an interesting question that um, has come in. Considering the new voting procedures based on national ID number rather than paper IDs, um, is there reason to believe and conclude that there was substantial manipulation of participation rates in the recent elections? And let me just add to that, that the Iranian regime also um, mandates that uh, people that are in prisons participate in, in voting, meaning uh, including the thousands of people who were jailed because of, the, of their opposition to the legitimate, uh, to the existence of the government itself, they were forced to participate in these elections from the prison cells. So um, let me have you all respond to this one on whether there's additional manipulation of numbers because of the transition from the paper ID to the digital ID numbers and, and whether um, there's additional corruption with forcing the prisoners to participate in elections. Who wants to go first? Uh, if I, I may, uh, so the, that's a thing. The I mean, the national ID is one of the main issues. It could be because potentially, I would say, I have no reason, I have no proof for that. But uh, I believe the government should, I mean, have the website publish any data regarding the that kind of votes, definitely. And those who, the number of votes who, is, who I mean, in, based on the provinces and even based on the every city or counties who are casted invalid. This is the kind of thing that the government didn't do that in the past. They used to do, but uh, since the last, parliamentary election, for example, for the city of Tehran, Mashhad is a, uh, is a big city or county in Iran, or Tabriz, they did not uh, reveal the, uh, the results of the invalid votes because we, we, we know that, I, I could guess, the number of people who cast their, their, cast their vote invalid was, at the time was huge, and for this election as well. So that's, a, that's an issue. And this time, the national ID is a very, uh, is a is a main concern of many many uh, scholars or researchers or even the political activists who want to know exactly what's the number of the people who cast their ballot. So we don't have proof for that, but it could. It's very suspicious. I, I, I I'm pretty much sure about that. For the prisoners, I didn't. I, I haven't heard the news about the prisoners that that you mentioned. I know that some of the prisoners, are such, such as Mr. Tarzlesh, he didn't vote. So the I don't know what you mean by forcing them so if they don't vote what what would uh, the government do happen to, uh, to happen to them so i don't have any idea about that please correct me if i'm wrong all of you yes i have no idea about that to be honest with you i haven't heard about that but it might be true or, or, or not i don't but the first yeah, one I, is very important. yeah i don't have anything about the you know prisoners either but but let me just make a few points about this whole issue look as you know in iran um people can vote anywhere Right, uh, they are not uh, uh, confined to a particular voting district that yeah, you need to be registered, etc. Second point: in this round, only four cities in Iran had full electronic voting. Everywhere else, it was paper uh, voting, which of course always raises the question of 
you know, uh, uh, as the joke goes, it's not, you know, uh, what you vote, it's who you count, who counts the votes that becomes, you know, uh, uh, important. That, that's another fact. Yes, you know, based on the use of national ID, we have seen anecdotal evidence of people coming and saying, you know, I went to vote and saw that uh, I was told that uh, I have already voted with my national ID number, so somebody else might have access to that. There was a report of, you know, in one particular district, people having the, the officials having access to be able to, you know, type in uh, the, the national ID numbers of, uh, you know, fictitious uh, voters in, 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 in that regard as well. Also, as Arash pointed out, it, it is really quite telling that I think this is the second election that I have seen, where the, the last one being the previous one in 2020, where the government doesn't even give you the exact number of how many people voted. You know, right now, the, the Minister of Interior said 25 million voted. Well, you know, what is the what is the uh, change, right, on that 25 million? They do not give you the exact number there or, or the breakdown based on the number of voters in each province. They have got, gotten the percentage of provinces, but not the actual number of voters. And as Arash pointed out, also no information exactly about what the actual number of the, you know, spoiled votes, the invalid ballots were, were, were all about. I, None of this is accident, right? And, and frankly, as you know, uh, you can no longer access the Ministry of Interior and many other sites in Iran from outside the country. That's another way the government has tried to you know, restrict this type of access. So I think all those things might be indication of uh, you know, the, the, the phenomena that they have something to hide by, by, from researchers like us who are interested in really what the numbers actually tell. Before I turn to Alex, I just want to point out in terms of the what, my, what I mentioned about prison votes. Um, uh, Karamullah Azizi, the head of the Karajas Qaz al Hasar prison, um, he, he has gone on record saying that people who do not vote has, have to face the consequences. The same reports have come out of other prisons as well. But you know, I just wanted to share that um, the idea didn't come from, from air. Um, Alex, please. I really don't have much to add, uh, uh, Marjan. I just wanted to remind everybody that, you know, for months and months, uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei knew this was going to be a humiliating of an election uh, process for him. And I think it didn't really help uh, that last year, Turkey had pretty decent election turnout and Erdogan came out looking very good. Uh, after those two rounds of elections, right after the Turkish elections, I remember sitting monitoring the sort of uh, the Iranian regime worrying about its own election, which just happened on the 1st of March. But we've, we've known because we've heard the regime say pretty much that it was not going to be a pretty low turnout. That's exactly what they got. Uh, they tried everything. I mean, they came out and said not voting is being against God. I mean, what more intimidation can you can you uh, resort to to try and scare people out? And yet you've seen a low turnout. And on top of that, as you heard from Arash Amirzad, the so-called invalid or blank votes. I mean, I think in Tehran, it's like 44% of those that voted, voted blank, which is the same as saying, I know I have to show up and vote because my boss might not might see me if, I, uh, if I'm here and that might be good for me, but I'm going to vote blank. So don't assume that means my me voting means I support the regime. I don't. So there are all sorts of ways of looking at, at this election process. But I think, you know, the... It, it, the regime wants to move on in the last few days and weeks. They have come come out and the propaganda wants us to believe that the enemy, whoever that is, the enemy want, wanted this election to be a failure and the enemy lost. But if you keep telling yourself that sort of propaganda, that doesn't mean you're going to have a solution to the real problem you, you have, which is you've lost the youth the future of the country. I think, Marjan, you pointed out the figure of 60 percent of the age of 30. What does that generation know? There is a generation that grew up under Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's, whatever that was, two terms, which we know resulted in where Iran has been extremely sanctioned country. I mean, today only Russia is more sanctioned as a country. Uh, so this is the young generation today that if they can emigrate, they're emigrating. Again, we don't have any hard evidence, but anecdotally, what you're seeing out of Iran right now is sort of re reminiscent of the early 1980s 
when people realized what Islamism and Khomeinism was about and they were leaving the country, something similar happened. A lot of these people who are leaving are not leaving because of politics, just because they've lost all hope. Uh, and frankly, I'm not sure if the regime really cares that much. I'm not sure if the regime cares that much. And what does the regime do in terms of solutions? Mostly gimmickry, mostly pretending that they have a solution. Let me give you one example, Marjan, I stop. You know, again, another neighbor of Iran that has the Iranian regime concern is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is pursuing this massive liberalization plan with all sorts of things that they're doing to appeal to the youth, sports diplomacy and so forth. So the Iranian regime has come up with this idea of they too want more tourists. So they're hiring influencers to, to come into Iran and, and show a new image of Iran, yet without changing anything in terms of the laws uh, that, that you know, would not uh, make tourism easier. So again, it just tells me there's no strategy, there's no serious debate about which way to go. They're stuck with their stock. And again, to repeat what something I said earlier, until Khamenei is gone, or in, because I doubt very much the man's gonna change his mind. He, he's decided with his God that this is going to be his legacy. And whatever comes after, that's for his successor to decide. Uh, but you know, I don't really see a much serious uh, pl policy planning happening at the highest level where it matters that might suggest to us that they might use a, an event like this election on the 1st of March to say, perhaps we should change course. I just don't see it. Thank you. We're coming to the end of the program. Um, I want to thank all of you. Um, um, and um, do we have time for final cl uh, closing thoughts or? We uh, do I have one point, uh, Marjan. Yeah. Why don't we? Why don't we close? And let me ask you if you could just put a so what in all of this for those of us sitting outside of Iran. What should we do? about the fact that these elections took place. If you could close with these thoughts in, in, in less than one minute each, that would be great. I just want a clarification. The number of people under the age of 30, the percentage of them are right now is 40, 45%. And it was 51% in the 2007, 2017, yeah. So, and it's gonna be less and less over the next couple of years. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's, I think my one minute's finished, though. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for everything. So, for the event, and thank you. If you want to um, have any closing thoughts on the so what and what do we do about this next? Uh, um, so we are we have to go through why the people. I, this is the most important thing for me is I should know and I have to do more some more research why the people with less educated is going to be less likely to participate in the election. I mean, the cast day ballot is one of the most important things. I have some hypotheses, I have some things in my mind, but I have to take a look, do more research and then get back to you or anyone else in the future. Topic for next discussion, Merzad. Um, I would say for me, the so what question is the hardening um, of, of, of the political, political arteries of the Islamic Republic. Uh, you know, again, we are seeing this serious uh, division, uh, the, the gulf between the regime and the population is increasing. Uh, you know, in, in Persian, we have the wonderful uh, word right, uh, to describe displeasure with the state. This is a political that we have, that we are observing in, in Iran. And I think it has all sorts Howdy. of, you know, yeah, exactly. I think it has all sorts of ramification for you know, uh, coming up. But the other part of that, so what question, is that you know, expect uh, a, a more hardline approach adopted by, by every elected body now in the country when it comes to the, uh, Iran's foreign policy as well. Thank you, Alex, final thoughts. Thank you. Well, the first margin, uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Mehrsad, for joining us. And thank you, Arash, for this wonderful survey, which I think is so rich in detail. I recommend everyone to pick up a copy and look at it. It's quite telling. And the way Arash and his team have done it, it really takes you into um, the, the, the sort of realities, in my view, sad realities that are uh, shaping political attitudes in Iran, but I highly recommend it. My my final thought is this. Uh, we've spent so much time this morning talking about why the regime did this or the other or what it means and what they're after. Another hard reality for us is that the regime thinks it can get away with it. 
Ali Khamenei thinks he can get away with, you know, putting someone like Hassan Rouhani for whatever people feel about him. But, you know, there was no reaction. And uh, the question then is what if you want to play the game of gradual change and forcing the Islamic Republic to change its, its politics and go in a different direction? How do you change this basic reality, this comfort level that Ali Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards have? How do you change that? Because I think that if once if it's done successfully, I'm not suggesting for a minute that's going to be easy, but if it, it's done and Khamenei can be uh, made uncomfortable and perhaps re um, second guesses himself and his, some of his decisions, that might just be a step in the right direction in, in, in the idea of political reform within the framework of the Islamic Republic, if it is possible at all. And I'm not sure on that, but let me stop there. Thank you very much. This concludes today's panel discussion on Iran's low record record low election turnout. I want to thank our panelists and experts, Arash Ghafuri, Mehrzad Bujerdi, and Alex Batanha. You can find out more about their work, which they referenced today. I encourage all of you uh, to follow up um, um, on Iran portal, Stasis, and of course, MEI's website, where you can also find a recording of today's conversation. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us from different parts of the world and encourage you to stay tuned for MEI's next events on this platform. Thank you and have a wonderful day.